Welcome. I'm Alison St. John, and this is a special edition of KOCT's North County Roundtable. Meet the City, it's called, and we'll have a personal in-depth look at Oceanside's City Council. During this period, we're going to be speaking with Peter Weiss, who is the City Council member representing District 4. And uh, Peter has actually been working at the City of Oceanside since the 1980s. He was appointed the mayor when Jim Wood uh, resigned and he is now serving as a city council member. So he's been with the city for years and years, and Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. So talk a little bit about how you first got involved with Oceanside back in the 1980s. What was your role then, and, and why did you even come here? So I had uh, worked actually in the nuclear industry, and I had worked in Pennsylvania after I graduated college, and then was transferred to the San Luis Obispo area, where I ended up meeting my wife, and. Uh, got laid off literally two weeks after our, we got married. And so I ended up going back to work uh, at the power plant through a friend of mine working for a contractor, but started looking for uh, jobs. And a lot of it was you know, looking for municipal jobs because I wanted to get into something that I went to school for. I, I had a degree in civil engineering technology, and so I applied for city jobs. Uh, had interviewed for the city of Oceanside for an entry-level engineer position. Uh, initially didn't get it. And then a few weeks later, I got a call and said, hey, that, would you still be interested in the position? I said, would love it. Actually, my wife and I moved uh, on Christmas Day in 1985, and I started work here uh, in, on January 6, 1986, as an entry-level engineer. And then you became the city manager. How many years were you the city manager? So I was city manager for about seven um, but from assistant engineer, I actually ended up becoming the city engineer over time and then the public works director before getting uh, into the city manager position. When you first arrived, did you see yourself moving up to the top position at the city? Did you have an idea that this might be a place that you could really make your home long term? I did aspire to be city engineer at some point, just seeing how um, the engineering side of things worked. I did not at any time until I got kind of offered the position of city manager that I expect to be city manager. In fact, um, I, I got appointed interim city manager. Barry Martin was interim, um, and then he had he he was planning on leaving in a few months. The city council uh, had a, some issues going through the recruitment process, and so that I got appointed interim uh, city manager, and then was asked by several of the council members to apply for the um, permanent position, which I did. And so I, I did not at that point in time think I would be city manager, uh, but coming from the engineering side where you, you know, part of the training is you fix things. Right. And, you know, bringing that and, you know, the tracking and scheduling to the city manager position, I think at that time, uh, as we were getting ready, you know, I didn't know at the time we were going to go into the recession, uh, but I was city manager through the Great Recession, and I think having a lot of those those skills where you look at things, fix things, take things apart, looking at how do you recover, how do you reduce costs and manage through that recession, I think coming from the engineering background was quite helpful. Well, speaking of fixing things, how was it for you to be suddenly thrust into the political side of things when you were appointed to be the mayor? How was that transition for you? Initially, it was pretty tough, uh, simply because there were a lot of people at the city who remember me and knew me as what I was. And so trying to break the, those habits, trying to break the historical knowledge part of things, well, let's go ask Peter. Um, that was, you know, it was a little easier for me to transition, but there were a lot of staff people that either worked for me directly or, you know, when I was city manager would recognize that I still had some you know, files and things. So the, the transition for me got a little easier. It was the training staff to um, break that habit that they needed to go through their, their chain of command. And it, it took a, a few months, but it, it got to where, um, they, you know, staff understood that, you know, my role has changed. You go from fixing things to being, you know, on the policy side. And, and honestly, for me, there are times where you get involved in things and say things that are more, that should be more through the city manager's office. Um, but at, at this point, having now served, going on three and a half, almost four years, I, I find myself getting out of it quite a bit now. I, I don't bother with the staff work anymore. So apart from relating to the staff differently, you'd be relating to the citizens. And of course, once you're uh, on the city council, you're a bit more exposed to public opinion. Has that been an issue for you? Uh, in the beginning, it was a little bit, and it was actually it was more for my wife. Uh, I don't I don't do the next door. I don't, I don't do. I have a Facebook page, but my daughter updates it only when I 
play music. Um, but my wife was following a lot of the social media, and so I had to get her to stop following that. <laughs> Too painful? <laughs> uh, she'd ask me, do you know who this person is? And it'd be, no, I don't know who they are. And you should see what they're saying. I don't need to know what they're saying. Um, y you know, a, a lot of the things that are said by people who never ask you a question, um, to me, I discount that to some degree. Uh, I'd be happy to engage people, you know, if they want to know my opinion on, on something, I usually give it. Uh, in fact, yesterday I ended up um, running into someone that I had not personally met before, but we had a long conversation about the homeless shelter. and. Um, you know, she can form her own opinion on me based on that conversation, and I'm okay with that. Um, but it's the people who don't try not to understand what is it that you're saying, thinking, or going to do um, that, that when they form those opinions that, you know, I, I discount that. Right. Well, I'm hoping our conversation today will help some people have more of a sense of, of where you're coming from. Um, even although not everyone can speak to you one on one, that's how you would like it, is that if people would speak to you directly rather than criticizing you on social media. I wouldn't mind that, but again, I don't see the criticisms since I don't follow it, so. Okay. Well, I wanted to ask you why um, you decided not to run for mayor. I mean, you were appointed the mayor, so, uh, you know, you could very easily have slid into, okay, well, now I'm going to run for that position, but you decided, no, I'm going to run for city council instead. Was there some reason you ch wanted to change the role? Um, yeah, partly I shot my mouth off when I got appointed saying I wasn't going to run. <laughs> I would fill out Jim's term and not run for mayor. Um, and there were several people who uh, took that to heart and were planning a run for mayor because I said I wasn't going to run. And so uh, in probably October, um, the year before the election, I publicly stated I wasn't going to run because one of them was Jack Feller. Um, and I committed to him that I would support him if he wanted to run. I had actually at one point not was not really interested in actually running for council. I was going to be finished. But I did get approached by a number of community groups and other folks to say, hey, you've at least brought some balance and reasonableness to the council. You should, you should look at running so we can you know, maintain that positive uh, investment environment. And that's what I, even during the campaign I used. I think Oceanside over the last probably six, seven years created a significant investment environment uh, for for everything, whether it's you know development of homes, businesses, attracting and retaining businesses, and to keep that invest positive investment environment uh, moving forward, I thought was important. So I decided to run. So now that you're a city council member, you're representing a district, uh, District Four, right, which is the um, southeast quadrant of the city, if I'm correct, right. Um, so is is this? Do you think a, a, a good move for the city to have gone to district elections? I mean, does that make a difference to how you are on the city council that you're representing one district instead of the whole city? Well, I, I don't look at it as representing one district. Th th yes, you are elected by the people within that district to represent their interests and pursue their interests. But you have to remember that. I am one vote amongst five representing the broader community. So there are times where there may be an issue within that district that conflicts with broader issues citywide. And, I, and for me, I think it's more important to be part and look at what are the impacts uh, on a citywide basis, not just what am I going to do for the residents in my particular district. So I think that there, there has to be a balance um, between looking at the bigger picture and the broader issues and broader needs of the community versus just that district. I have mixed feelings about having gone to the district elections. Um, when we were going through that process, we were, I don't really think we had much of a choice as there were lawsuits against not just cities but school districts. But what did what became painfully evident going through that process is that the average voter's vote got diluted. So in the past, I got to vote for five council people, mm -hmm. the mayor and four council people. Now I get to vote for one. Mm and the mayor at large. So where in the past I had a broader, as a voter, I had broader influence over who's gonna represent the city on the city council, now it's just within that one district. Good. So th th I think there's, there's positives and there's negatives with that, um, but, but I think you know, over time we'll, we'll just have to see how, how it plays out, not just with us, but with the school districts as well. Right. I mean, I think the reason that we went to districts was so that it would make it easier for people to get elected because you could get elected in a, a more restricted area. You could afford to run a campaign. So it would expand the, the sorts of people who could run for office and therefore expand diversity on the city council. Um, however, as you say, on the other hand, there is perhaps this question of 
Oceanside is changing very fast. And um, does it set one district up against another? For example, we see a lot of investment going into the coastal area with the new resort um, along the beach, for example. Do you see it as being a problem that now you've got districts that are sort of vying for resources in the city? I, I don't see it as that much of a problem. I, I think, and, and the, the easy example I'll use is streets. We all live on a street that over time needs maintenance and an upgrade. And, I, and the city uses a, a system to determine which ones they, they are. Something like that I think should be distributed in a manner in which everybody gets a little bit of something because at some point, you're trying to offset maintenance costs, lower dollars with ultimate repair, which are much higher dollars. But when it comes to long-term investment, in, whether it's a downtown or within District 4, we have the Ocean Ranch Business Park. Mm -hmm. To me, there needs to be a focus on getting businesses and retaining businesses in that business park, regardless of the rest of the city, because it's the business park. And whether it's District 4 or any other district, we need to do a good job in making sure we attract high quality businesses to the community, uh, regardless of what district it's in. And so I, I think that there, there are always, I, on a council, I think there should be a balance. You should be able to look at, if I'm, am I losing something from my district or is the city as a whole gaining something? And I think there needs to be that balance. There needs to be that approach. And I would hope it's there with all of the elected officials. Um, to be able to balance those needs and not just focus on something parochial within my district. Yeah. Now, one of the issues that is the most controversial at the moment is the, the question about folks who are on the streets who are homeless. And um, you mentioned that you've had constituents talking to you about that. Do you see the need for the districts to sort of share in the responsibility for how to deal with that? Because it looks as though perhaps most of the resources that are being assigned for the homeless finally are perhaps more in District 1. And I wondered if you feel like there's, there's um, a responsibility for the other districts to step up and say, well, you know, why don't we do something to help solve this problem? I would say no in regards to the districts. I, I think we, that's where we need to break down and eliminate those district lines and look at what do we need to do to affect the homeless population. And it's not just within the city, it needs to be within the region. My bigger issue, and when I was mayor, uh, we, had, we have a monthly mayor's meeting with the uh, Escondido, San Marcos, Vista, Oceanside, and Carlsbad and with our supervisor. To me, the issue of homelessness needs to be broader across all of North County, not just each city doing one little piece. It needs to be coordinated so that we are not duplicating services, but we are looking at expanding services. And one of the examples I use is mental health services. Um, we are in desperate need in North County for adequate mental health services. And at one point, Tri-City provided that. That is not happening right now. I think there's a plan to restore some of those services. But the mental health services, uh, one of the big issues is where can we get the county to help us, all the cities, provide mental health support services? Because you know, in many of these cases, we can't arrest the homeless anymore. And honestly, jail isn't the right place for them anyway. And you can't arrest them because unless there's a place for them to go, they have a right to be where they are, yes. correct? Right. And okay. even if they're drug users or whatever the case may be, some of those things have been so decriminalized that it's a ticket. Um, but how do we get someone like that into a situation where they can get help? And I think one of the things we've just recently done is awarded a homeless shelter um, contract, if you will. So hopefully, and we also now have, we do have a sobering center. We have McAllister that we're partnering with for uh, substance abuse issues that hopefully uh, it'll make some difference to somebody. You know, one of the things I found is that there are as many answers to the homeless issue as there are homeless. There's not one magic bullet. If there were, we wouldn't have the problem we're having, you know, within the county and certainly within the state. And so I think anything we can do that will provide some means of helping them and ignore those district lines, where do we have to get people that we can get the help? If you use District 4, the county opened their new Health and Human Services office, uh, and you know hopefully they'll be able to manage some of that. With the shelter, we can manage some more. Um, but we've got to do something, and it shouldn't matter what district it's in. Mm. So this new shelter with uh, about 50 beds, I understand, you've just assigned a contract to uh, the rescue mission, um, and there is some question as to why it is that the organization that has been working in North County for so long, Interfaith, did not get that contract. So maybe you can explain why that happened. Well, on my side, it was pretty simple. And two things. One, the, the rescue mission is partnered with Bread of Life, who has 
been operating, they did a winter shelter for years and years. I think this last year was the first time they didn't. Um, but my, my issue was fairly simple, and as I stated during the council meeting, I thought Interfaith had a great proposal. Um, I think both organizations are, are competent. I think both could provide the service. My concern was with the Interfaith proposal, it required a $1 million a year subsidy from the city. And city staff identified just over 600000 that would be available, and that's new money, and that would have taken all of it. And, and as I said during the council meeting, the rest of the money, we hope we're gonna get county money, we hope we're gonna get state money, we hope we're gonna get federal money. To me, the most cost-effective solution was the rescue mission, which is going to self-fund their operating costs, which would leave us with 600,000 to expand homeless services, whether it's additional meal programs, whether it's um, additional housing opportunities, and even if Interfaith, if we wanted to fund Interfaith with a reduced shelter, maybe not 50 beds, maybe 20 beds where we could actually afford to pay it versus hoping we're gonna get money to pay a contract that we can't afford. Um, I know that Greg Angel, who heads the Interfaith, was quoted in the papers saying that he's worried that by going with re the rescue mission, uh, quote, we won't have the low barrier approach that we need. In other words, um, that the rescue missions approach will not have a low barrier for the homeless to get in. It will be requiring certain things from the homeless before they can get a place. And so Greg is suggesting that that might not actually get enough of the homeless off the streets, which is what Oceanside is looking to do. How do you respond to that? Uh, I don't know that I do respond to that because I know that came up during the council meeting and um, Donnie D of the rescue mission said we are a low barrier um, service so they will be taking low barrier entries and referrals any referral um, both organizations were going to be operating on referrals uh, and both have it, and publicly acknowledged that they would uh, continue they would do that if they were selected okay and uh, I know this is a, a controversy about how to handle the homeless the, the the housing first approach that you give the homeless a house and then you work with them on re-establishing their lives rather than expecting them to live up to some kind of standard before giving them a home so what, what is your approach to the, to the homeless first, the housing uh, first approach? I, I think there's a need for all of them, both of them. Uh, in fact, when we were dealing with the uh, tents along Oceanside Boulevard, I was supportive of finding a piece of property, whether it was city owned or not, uh, where we would put tents, because I had talked to Rodney who was down there. Uh, I talked to some of the people and said, these people just want to be in tents. They don't trust, you know, the, you know, I'm here with the government, trust me, they don't. And so I'm comfortable with any approach that it's going to help someone. And I'm not saying one's better than the other. Um, it's like fast food. One's a Burger King, one's a McDonald's, one's a Taco Bell. They all provide fast food, but they all do it in a different manner, and yet there's a need for all of them. And I think with the homeless issue, it's the same thing. Uh, whether it's housing first, I think there's a need for that. I think there are people that would avail themselves to that. I think there's also a need for some accountability for some people. And I still would support if we found a place that we could put some tents up, where we could bring in sanitary facilities, where we could bring in mental health services. Um, I, I think it makes a lot of sense to, at least, so they're not spread out, we can contain it somewhere, provide them a safe facility. Uh, and I would, I would support still doing that. Yes, I mean, that's interesting. I, I saw that you said that, that uh, you say some, some of the homeless choose to live in encampments. We don't understand that, but they do. So you're, you're saying, um, you know, if this is what they want, maybe we should provide something that, that is what they want and, and give them a specific spot to, to camp. So do you feel like that is something you'd still work for on the city council? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. because if you do that, you might be able to get to them so that one of them says, you know what, I will take that hotel voucher. Mm. I will go to the shelter. How do you get them to do that if they're spread out all over? Uh, if we can contain it and give them an opportunity, and like I said, and bring in you know, reasonable sanitary facilities, bring in some services. Uh, I, I think it, it's just one more step, one more tool in the toolbox to help people get on a, the path to self-sufficiency. Mm -hmm. Just one more question on that before I leave it, because uh, Interfaith Community Services has been working for so long in North County and has done so much um, that some people are were a bit shocked, really, that the City Council has brought in an agency like the Rescue Mission, which has just got a very recent profile in the, in the community. Um, do, do you feel like that this is saying something about how you think the Interfaith Community Services is performing in North County? Oh, not at all. And in fact, I, I believe, and I, I don't see, I didn't see the number, uh, but I, I had heard that we still have a million dollars of, of various contracts with Interface Services, and those aren't being changed whatsoever. The issue was who's going to operate a shelter, which we don't have right now, 
uh, and hopefully we will soon. So no, it doesn't change my opinion of what Interfaith does or doesn't do. I think they're a very competent organization and we're still using them for a number of issues. In fact, the uh, social workers we have that go out with our homeless outreach team are Interfaith uh, employees. Right, so. right. So uh, the other side of homelessness, of course, is, is housing. And um, the, it's sort of two ends of the continuum, isn't it? That there's just not enough affordable housing in the community. And Oceanside has a, a state mandate, actually, to build thousands more houses in the next few decades. So on the city council, that is one of the big questions, is how to, how to provide the zoning to build more dense housing in Oceanside. So talk a bit about where you think Oceanside can build more dense housing in order to meet uh, not just state law, but the demand of our local constituents. Well, it's interesting that the number you mentioned uh, it's, is our regional housing needs assessment, right. which is around 5,000 units. Uh, we just got um, an update, uh, the council did last week, and it went out to a uh, broader community about some background studies that are being done for the city's uh, general plan update. And I ended up this morning going through one of them and they identified that between now and 2050 we have to provide an additional 21,000 residential units and I'm going I, I, I'm, I was like flabbergasted how, how do you get to 20 just Oceanside 21,000 21,000 because it was 5,500 the last week. Right? that's what it is right. and so our arena numbers are the, are the 5,000 number right. um, but the, the obviously between now and 2050 the, that those numbers are going to continue to grow mm. For the foreseeable future, I think uh, from in looking at all the staff information, we have the zoning to provide for it. The issue is going to be finding the market for someone to come in and build them. So between you know the Coast Highway corridor study that we did that allows for increased density, you know along the transportation corridors, whether it's 76 um, Oceanside Boulevard, I think there are opportunities um, for uh, more dense development. I know one of the, the issues being looked at is allowing residential development in commercial centers. So over top of smart and final, um, I think it's going to be a little bit, the demand I think would be there. It's how do you find someone who's willing to invest mm. into building it? The city doesn't build those things. We just provide the opportunity. Are there enough market driven forces out there that will come in and look at doing some of those things um, to add the density along the transit corridors? Um, you know, we can provide the opportunity, but someone's got to be able to make, I mean, that's the, what they're doing is for to make money. And so how do you provide that opportunity? Well, I mean, that is a, a good question because the big development that you were proposed, what, that was proposed, that a developer brought to you, it was in Morrow Hills um, for over 500 homes, which is, you know, a large development in an agriculturally zoned area. And so it was very controversial. So are you saying that there just aren't the developers bringing you the projects for the smaller ones that would be along, say, Mission and uh, Oceanside Boulevard and Vista Way, which is where your planning would like to see that development? Yes, and I think we are going to, as a city, need to incentivize some of that development to occur, uh, which we can do. Um, the only other development that I'm aware is on file. There is a project near the transit uh, center at uh, Crouch Street and Oceanside Boulevard. And um, I saw a preliminary plan for that, and I think that should that warrants a higher density than what they're proposing. Um, but it's it's how do you get how do you change that market driven force so that someone out there is has the investment ability to come in and build those things? And I've I'm just not seeing that there's a big push right now to do that. Well, before we run out of time, I wanted to touch a little bit on the beaches, which is such a defining factor for the city of Oceanside. And we're banking on the beach remaining there because we've got this new resort now. And uh, so being, becoming like a family tourist destination is sort of part of, of, of what seems to be the vision for Oceanside, right? Do you have concerns about um, how we're going to keep the sand on the beaches and, and, and whether we have the money to do that? Um, I'm, I, right today, I don't have a concern about how to keep the sand on the beach because there is no sand on the beach. Um, <laughs> if you go to Buccaneer Beach, it's all rocks. Right. Um, so, but, but the answer is yes, uh, obviously yes. And, you know, there had been efforts in the past through Sandag to do beach replenishment, which has a defined life to it. It doesn't, it's not an automatic ongoing issue. Uh, we are nearing the end, um, from what I saw last week from uh, staff, of a study uh, that the city commission, because we have been waiting for 14 years for the Corps to do a beach 
the nourishment study, which you know they have never finished. So we went out, funded our own study. Um, I saw a summary of that study. I've not seen the actual study. I believe it's going to come to the council in August or early September. I believe there's a public, another public meeting this week, I believe, um, to um, go over the results and recommendations of that study. So I think we need to do whatever it is we can to protect our beaches, to restore our beaches, and keep the sand on the beach. Um, because it, tourism is such a driving economic force for Oceanside, we need to do what we have to do uh, to protect that resource. I noticed that in some of the background reports for this new general plan update that you're about to do, the environmental one, there's no mention at all of climate change, which of course is connected to sea level rise, which is affecting the, the sand on the beach. Do you feel like uh, the, the city is taking climate change and the risk of fire, for example, seriously enough? I do because we adopted a couple years ago a separate climate action plan. And so it may not be included in this general plan update effort, but we did adopt a whole separate climate action plan with a number of strategies and targets in them to address um, climate change. Okay. Um, so one of the questions is whether you will continue, whether you're enjoying being a politician, being an elected city council person enough to, to run again for District 4 in the next election. I will not be running again. You have made that clear. I've made that clear. And do you want to just give us a, a reason, some of your reasoning? I think it's time. I supported the issue of term limits. I wish they would have been shorter. Um, you know, people, when they get into these positions, they need to recognize it's a temporary job. It's not something that you should make a career out of. I have spent a, a career with the city of Oceanside. The city of Oceanside has been good to me. Uh, I think it's time for somebody else to step in and bring newer and fresh ideas. Um, and I, I think there are people out there. One of my jobs has been trying to rec recruit people uh, to actually run. And so I think um, when my term ends, I'll be done. I'll be happy to walk away and turn the, turn the keys over to someone else. Well, I'm, I'm sorry we didn't get time to even talk about the fact that you're in a rock and roll band, <laughs> <laughs> a multifaceted city council member. Um, but I'd like to thank you very much for spending this time with us and maybe just finally give us a quick thumbnail of how you would like to see if your vision for Oceanside, which is changing very fast, you can see when you go down to the, the ocean front how fast it's changing. What would you say your vision for the next few years of Oceanside? How would you like to see it growing? Uh, I, th I think I would like to see us push for more higher end revenue generating development, whether it's jobs, attracting, retaining key uh, jobs. We still have property uh, within our non-residential areas that we need to get out there and attract and bring businesses in that, that pay a wage where people can actually live here. Um, and the same thing with housing. I think we need to bring in housing um, across all affordability spectrums, not just the low income housing, but we need to find a way to get people to um, build homes where our entry level, and I don't just want to pick on police and fire, but librarians, the engineers, the planners can live here. If we can get people living here and working here, we don't have to be on the road commuting to Riverside or San Diego. And so to me, getting those jobs, getting those um, incentivizing, because we obviously we can't go build them, but getting people out there recognizing that Oceanside is a good place to do business um, and luring them in here and you know trying to get them to build here in Oceanside uh, so we can get the jobs, get the houses, and keep people here. Because right now, my kids can't afford to live here. This is a problem many people face, yes. So District 4 City Councilman Peter Weiss, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Well, thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us. Watching KOCT Television in Oceanside.